right, uh, welcome to our November edition of the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Movie Night. I appreciate everybody showing up tonight. I hope we have a great discussion. Uh, a lot to talk about with this movie. Um, not just the movie itself, but all the behind the scenes stuff um, as well, uh, to include the camera work, um, which I'm really looking forward to, to talking about later on in the segment. Um, but the movie that we're talking about tonight is, of course, 1917, uh, which was a 2019 production. Um, I had to practice saying that a few times because I've messed it up significantly before. Um, this movie was produced by several companies to include DreamWorks. Um, it was distributed by Universal uh, here in the United States, and it was released here in the U.S. on Christmas Day in 2019. Um, I don't know if anybody got a chance to step out on Christmas Day to go see it at the theaters. I did not, unfortunately. Um, as everybody knows, this movie follows two soldiers who were assigned to deliver a message uh, that will save about 1,600 British troops from making a deadly mistake of, walk of walking into a German trap. Um, and it was really inspired by uh, the stories that the director's grandfather told him as he was growing up. Um, his director's grandfather was in World War I. Um, and as it turns out, one of the actors, uh, Dean Charles Chapman, as he was doing his research for the movie, found out that his grandfather was also in World War I, or his great-grandfather, excuse me. And um, it turns out that his great-grandfather uh, was actually wounded and stuck in no man's land for four days. Um, so that really hit home for that actor, that particular actor, uh, as he was doing his research, doing his preparation for the movie, and then in filming it as well. Um, the premise behind the movie itself um, is loosely based on a real German uh, of, of feint, actually, uh, which was codenamed Operation Albrecht. Um, and this was a strategic withdrawal that the Germans uh, put into place, um, which really helped them defend the Hindenburg line. So part of the movie was based on actual events. Um, like I said, loosely, though, uh, there's a lot of criticism in the movie as far as its historical accuracy goes. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, the director uh, was Sam Mendez. Uh, some of you might know him from two Bond movies that he uh, directed, Skyfall and Spectre, two of the newer Bond films. And he also directed American Beauty and Road to Perdition with Tom Hanks. Um, and he also gets a co-writing credit uh, in this film, too. Um, the cinematographer for this film was Roger Deakins, um, and I can't wait to talk about him. He is uh, known for his cinematography work in Shawshank Redemption, uh, Fargo, The Big Lebowski, um, and many other Coen Brother movies. As a matter of fact, he collaborated with the Coen Brothers on 12 different movies, um, also to include Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, which is a favorite of mine, and No Country for Old Men. And then the production designer, too, I can't wait to talk about this as well, uh, was Dennis Gassner. Um, fantastic job he did in this movie. And when we talk about what he had to, uh, the, the hurdles and obstacles that he faced with this, um, it's, it's really amazing. Um, what I want to uh, start with is just what everybody thought of the film itself. Uh, did you like it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And considering that we saw it so recently, you know, in the last 11, 12 months, um, to watch it again so soon, um, I, I noticed things I hadn't seen the first time. Yeah, I watched it um, for the very first time, maybe four weeks ago, um, and I have not seen it since. I'm going to go back and watch it tonight, I think. Um, I was thinking about it today and looking at my notes, and I was just kind of jazzed about it you know, going back and seeing it again. Um, I, I bought the movie. I'm, I'm kind of a World War I historian now. Um, and it was kind of interesting. I, I went to Europe again in February before COVID caught up and spent uh, 10 days, primarily World War I battlefields and particularly in the, wow. of the, Somme, the Somme and Ypres and down in the American place like Mount Facon and Moose Ardennes and Bella Woods. And I think the movie, even if there's issues with the plot, the, the equipping of the soldiers, the, uh, the trenches, the, you'll see, look at the British trenches when the movie begins and later you'll see the German trenches and notice that the German trenches have concrete 
much more well-designed fortifications than the British. Uh, not a whole lot of water in the trenches, which was unusual for British things where the soldiers were often up to their knees in water in certain areas. Uh, note also in the trenches, how they've dug into the sides. The British and the Americans and the French all took that trench and made side quarters. And I'm talking not deep, deep bunkers, which both the British and the French and, and the Germans created, but look how they're like individual shelters. And this is 1917. Watch the mindset of the leadership. And I'm not gonna tell the whole story, but at the beginning, notice a general who briefs the soldiers. He's wearing a black armband which means he had a loss, a close loss already in the war preceding this. There are over 1 million British and British Empire soldiers killed in this war. And you'll see why, uh, that's all I'll say, because there's much too much to talk about, but you'll well, find it. Well, actually, actually, Bob, that's one of my talking points is uh, the trench designs by uh, the, the, I wanna say two sides, uh, three sides too, if you include the French. Um, and so we will get to that. Uh, I, I did have a, a, a question to everybody about the trench designs, um, especially as they're depicted in the movie. So excellent point. Excellent point indeed. Um, I'll get off with the first question, uh, which takes place, you know, before they actually go on their mission. Um, and it really doesn't have to do with the plot of the film or anything. It, it's more a bit of um, uh, symbology. Uh, as the movie goes. Um, and the question I had was that I asked everybody to take note of uh, Lance Corporal Blake's and Schofield's body positions at the beginning of the film. Um, and how does this correspond to their body positions at the conclusion of their roles? I would say the conclusion of the film, but Blake does pass about halfway through. Um, but what do you think that uh, the director and the screenwriter was was saying by uh, and and I'll, I'll just put it out there. Their body positions were exactly the same at the conclusions of their roles. Um, if you notice at the beginning, uh, Blake is laying on his back, looking at the sky. Schofield's leaning up against a tree, half asleep. And that's how they finish each each uh, of their roles um, in the film. But what do you think that they're they're trying to put forward by, you know, having them in the exact same positions? I kind of looked at it that, you know, all of this stuff that happened to them, it didn't change anything. It was just the, the uselessness of war, the, the uh, you know, the pointlessness, I guess. It's just another day. Let's move along, right? I noticed, uh, this is Kent, hi. Um, I noticed um, the, also the sort of, uh, the the background the bucolic background you know I mean it starts out uh, for a war movie you know I mean it shows the beautiful landscape in the background the beautiful trees and stuff and all that and I, 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 then you're very quickly you know in the the grittiness of the trenches and so forth um, and then it, it, but it ends that way too uh, that struck me at the end the director has the same, a similar, you know, landscape in the background as Schofield, you know, finally lies down or whatever against that tree in the same position that he was in the beginning. I just thought, you know, drawing the quick contrast between, you know, the rest of the world and the, and the world at war, the part that was at war, you know, was, it struck me. It was, it was but it was kind of a band, uh, 400 miles of, of a complicated spider web of trenches on either side. Uh, you could quickly move depending on where you were in the, in, along that band of, of trench system. You could go back somewhat quickly and find yourself surrounded by greenery and fields. Uh, a typical experience of a British company in the trenches would be four days in the trench in the front, four days in the communication trenches which spider web their way back, and then four, four days in the back bringing supplies up to hand to those who are going to carry them forward. Uh, you could be in greenery relatively quickly, but it might take you four hours to slog two miles through those communication trenches because as the movie depicts well, it was chaotic and crowded. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't, it was, it was a mess, but uh, a mess. that's a great example of, of ending the way they started. But also um, in all of that to see like some of those self-standing 
places, you know, like that empty farmhouse that they went into and stuff, just, just there, not destroyed. I thought that was very, I, I had not thought about things remaining. The, uh, if, if, uh, Eric, do you want to answer that or you want me to take it? Uh, oh, go right ahead, Bob. Okay. Um, behind the German lines, uh, the Germans were far more logistically challenged, especially by 1917, than the Allies were. And they would strip everything from farm field, from farmhouses, from villages, uh, as, a, as the German lines began to disintegrate in 1918 after the Great Spring Offensive. Uh, the, 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 the Allied soldiers moving into the areas occupied by the Germans found everything gone. They cut the down the trees. The village that was not bombarded to dust. Doors, no wood, because that was all burnt. It seems like, I was just going to say, it seems like everybody um, got the same impression I did initially from, you know, those body positions. It, it, it really signified the status quo of, you know, World War One's primary attribute, which was the trench warfare, um, you know, campaigns. Um, and many accounts of how this aspect of World War One remained unchanged, regardless of how hard each side tried to change it. It still stayed pretty sedentary, uh, pretty much the same. And and so you're right. Everybody, you know, pointed that out. The, the, the pointlessness of it all. Nothing changes. Doesn't matter what you do. And also, um, I, I also saw something that, that somebody had said that it also gives the feeling of a journey being complete, um, which... I can see that uh, maybe more from Lance Corporal Schofield's side than anything else. Um, certainly you know, not from Lance Corporal Blake, uh, but just just the fruitlessness of it all. Um, really, that's, that's what really struck me. But to speak to your point, Bob, absolutely. Uh, you know, with being able to go back, you know, not even a mile and have like a completely different scenery, a completely different uh, aspect of how the war is being conducted. Um, and it really, it really struck me in that opening scene when they do get up and they just start walking and all of a sudden they're in the trenches. Um, and, you know, within two or three minutes, you go from the serenity to the hell. Uh, and that was just to read about it is one thing to actually see it in a visual process is something else altogether. And, and one thing to remember, um, the, the grayness of that battlefield that you see in the movie, uh, that was often not the case, uh, where, where there had not been any offensives. Uh, you know, they, they, all the soldiers said they never heard silence. And that's one thing you'll notice in the movie. It's pretty quiet. And normally people in the First World War said they could never get away from the sound of rifle fire, machine guns or artillery, even if it's in the distance. That noise was always there. But in some areas, like if you look at the Battle of the Somme in July 1, 1916, uh, there's films that they took of that morning. And the soldiers were actually advancing over hills that had, that had not wheat, but some sort of tall grass. So it wasn't always gray. But if the fighting had been intense, like that was in July of 1916. By, and they continued the offensive all the way through November. By September or October, nothing would be green, it would all be turned over mud and the craters that you see in this movie. It would look much like that. I'm actually very jealous of your experiences, Bob. I, I too also, um, you know, as a historian, World War I is, is something that I really like to focus on. And I've never been able, uh, as my many travels throughout Europe, I've never been able to go to any of the battlefield sites. Um, that will change the next time I go. Uh, but uh, hopefully I can go with one of your tours. That'd be great. Um, but, you know, like I, like I just said, you know, to read about it is one thing, to actually see it yeah. um, and, and be in those areas. I, I'm looking forward to that opportunity when it comes someday. Well, all you have to do is become like me, become old, retired, and have a wife who'd rather you go by yourself than have to endure walking around fields in the middle of nowhere. That's all you have to do. <laughs> Um, 
Moving on to uh, the discussion before the mission, um, General Aaron Moore, who was played by Colin Firth in the film, uh, do you think he made the right decision to send Lance Corporal Blake on the mission? Uh, and I ask that because, you know, there's there's a conflict there, um, you know, between clear be, between being clear minded in the mission and having conflicts because a family member is involved, his brother, uh, as it turns out to be, um, and more of a passionate versus dispassionate um, approach to completing this mission. What do you think of that? Well, there was the time when, you know, Schofield wanted to turn around. I mean, he said, why'd you even pick me in? And why'd you make me go, th why are you making me go through this? And he said, you don't have the motivation that I do. I think the general recognized that he would have the, you know, he, he would have the motivation. He wouldn't go AWOL or turn, turn back or anything because, you know, he had that personal connection, which Schofield didn't have. And, and it allowed him to kind of say, I don't know, maybe I would like to turn back. Kent, I think you make a good point. Um, he he didn't wait until dark like uh, mm -hmm. Schofield wanted him to. He yeah. he pushed on immediately, and that was because it was his brother. So he, he had the motivation. But do you think that was fair for him to ask that of him? I mean, I thought absolutely I, not. Yeah. Okay. Not yeah, right. I didn't I don't think so either. But. <laughs> But, but he was, yes, he was totally motivated, but okay, yeah. Motivated, yes, but maybe not as clear-headed um, as, you know, as maybe he should have been uh, for the mission. Uh, and it, it kind of leads into the next question. We've already touched on that a bit. Um, you know, Schofield did express his concerns. Um, you know, he did want to wait till nightfall. Uh, he did, you know, want to think about this, and maybe plan it out a little bit. Whereas Blake was just like, this is my brother. Let's get going now. He didn't, he didn't want to put any thought into it. He just wanted to start moving um, to save his brother's life. And so I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. I don't know if maybe that was the correct decision or not. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, if this was a real life situation, um, well, no, I can't say that because the generals, that was one of the, it, uh, let me catch up with myself. That was one of the criticisms of the movie uh, by historians was that you would not see this during World War I. Um, generals did not put this kind of thought into saving regular soldiers' lives. It just did not happen. Um, it was a, a movement forward, um, regardless of the costs. Uh, and so you wouldn't see, as you see General Aaron Moore here, you wouldn't see him considering um, saving these soldiers' lives, perhaps. Uh, and also, if I may add, sure. this, is, this is where the movie goes to fiction. Right. Because right. the general makes a convenient statement of saying, I'm sending you forward because all the telephone lines are cut. And that's, that's mythology. The telephone lines were routinely cut, but they had runners very rarely, you know, it would be far more easy for them to go back through the communication trenches and then hop on a motorcycle and ride around to the other part of the trenches where the, the, the future attackers were located. This is what they had to do to concoct a story with two people. It's much like Saving Private Ryan, where you send eight, eight or so rangers go out looking for a man during the middle of the Normandy invasion. You know, that's, that's fiction as well. Uh, so but, a little more, but a little more believable in World War II than World War I. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but in World War One, uh, to send a runner through, you know, before they would send a runner, they would have ordered those units to move into the evacuated areas long before they'd say, hey, you two run out there in the middle of nowhere and try to find these people. They just wouldn't do that. But that takes away from the story. You know, the story is fiction, but it's a great story. And, you know, we can't, like, when we try to figure out what the motivation of these soldiers are, like, why didn't they wait till nightfall? No one would go out into no man's land in daytime unless they were ordered to attack. No one would go out in daytime. Nighttime is when they fixed their barbed wire, when they dug their trenches, when they sent out scouting parties. And by 1917, 1918, German stormtrooper units, you know, the stormtroopers we think of the Second World War, the Germans realized by 1916, mass attacks don't work. So they had highly skilled units called stormtroopers who would storm a trench. They would come in without artillery. So that was what was going on in 1917. But once again, let's not let reality destroy a beautifully 
wonderful story. Okay, let's like, hey, the script said you go in the daytime, so they go in the daytime so you can film the destruction between the lines. Well, at the same time, Bob, too, um, you know, they were certain that the Germans had pulled back. There was nobody there. Um, and so if you were going out there during the daytime, you know, they, 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 were, they were very confident uh, that they were not going to face any sort of resistance because the Germans had pulled back, which they, which they did. Um, but my, my, my favorite question that I always ask during this, uh, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but I'll throw mine out right now, was, um, oh, let me look at my notes here. I can't remember his name. Lieutenant Leslie. Uh, yeah. who was the first officer that they encounter before they go over. Yeah. And he's telling them that they're crazy. You're going to get shot. You're not going to make it 100 feet. Um, and they're telling Lieutenant Leslie, hey, you know, they're pretty certain that there's no troops over there. So we're going to give it we're going to give it a go. Um, it's a difficult decision. You really have to uh, put your faith in the intelligence, um, which wasn't very well. It wasn't completely reliable it never is but it wasn't really reliable during world war one um so that that's another aspect that you have to think about when they're going over the top in broad daylight but you're right that was not a common move uh to go to even put your head up and look around in broad yeah. daylight you just didn't do it yeah, i like when he said uh throw the flare gun back you know so we can, <laughs> the don't get it, we can use it again <laughs> must have thought they weren't going to make it very far <laughs> I just, I like to, to settle a bet for us. What day is it? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. Yeah. <clears throat> it's Friday. Oh, this idiot over here, he thought it was Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things when I, when, well, when I used to be able to give tours at the museum when we were open to the general public, um, one of the things that I really like to use to point out in the World War I section was the technology that came about during this period. Um, and General Aaron Moore pointed it out in the bunker as he's describing the mission. And it does come about in different parts of the film as well. Uh, what technological innovations were highlighted, particularly one uh, in the general's dugout, and then again on the protagonist's journey through no man's land? Kind of a softball question. Well, that they had aerial uh, photography to see what, what the troop movements were. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, the airplane was a completely new concept on the battlefield. Um, I've read some accounts where even just seeing it for the first time by soldiers on both sides, it just scared the bejesus out of them. What is this thing flying around up in the air? Um, and then, you know, they, they began using the airplane for reconnaissance missions, uh, for photography. And then somebody got the bright idea that we can uh, give the pilots these bombs that they can drop, too. Once they started doing that, wow, that just really put the fear of God into these troops. By, by 1916, uh, initial, Eric, everything you said is absolutely true. By 1916, the air arm of both the Germans and the English and French had turned towards uh, attack missions of attacking trenches. And the Germans did the same. And soldiers on the ground were absolutely frightened of being strafed by the aircraft that were in the air. It was very, very worthwhile for them to stand deathly still to not show themselves moving. a uh, matter of fact, by 1917, uh, an Australian general named McNash in the area of the Somme uh, actually created resupply by air. That's how quickly aviation, the First World War was going. But in 1915, generals in both, primarily among the French and English, refused to accept photographs taken from the air because they're saying, here's the trenches. And they said, well, that's not a map, that's a picture. And that's the old culture having to <laughs> finally displace into understanding, look, we can get images and really see what's there, not just a, you know, a concept on paper. And by 1917, they were wise to be cautious. Yeah, exactly right, Bob. Um, and I love telling you know, those stories you know, at the museum. And it wasn't just airplanes either. Um, you know, the machine gun, that was a novel in, uh, innovation at the time. 
Um, the chemical weapons that they used uh, initially, um, just, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of strange to point out how awesome military technology, you know, comes about uh, because it's such a deadly um, force, but really through military innovations and in technology leads to civilian innovations and in technology. Um, you will see a lot of times where military innovations spur the civilian side of it as opposed to the other way around. Um, it's terrible, uh, but at the same time, you know, it does have its benefits. I, I, I dread to say it that way, but it is true. No, you're right. And it's not just the military technology. It was also things later, um, not in World War I, but in World War II, like uh, distribution of penicillin and things like that. So there are a lot of good things that come out of military technology, you know, health-wise, as well as military danger. Oh, you're absolutely right about that, Marianne, for sure. Um, getting to the more personal side of these two actors in their roles, um, you hear Blake start to question Schofield about his medal um, and why he doesn't wear it and what happened to it. Um, and I, I, if I'm not mistaken, Schofield says he traded it for uh, a bottle of wine uh, and a loaf of bread or something like that. Um, but this was, you know, something that was supposed to be more with pride. Uh, and it signified your bravery um, on the battlefield. Uh, but after uh, Schofield was, took part in, in the Somme offensive, um, and he didn't see it that way at all. Um, what do you think this says about his thoughts on the war itself? I see shades of Sassoon, the, the great British poet. He was an officer who was highly decorated because in combat he was quite the tiger, but he, he grew disgusted by the war and realizing that you know brave and valiant people were dying to gain yards of mud and there seemed to be no solution to it. And many of them felt the same way. And I think this is sort of a tribute to Sassoon and other British people who towards the end. And if you notice, he says, he says, I don't, the question is asked of him about some battle. He says, I don't remember because he, you can only presume that he's been there. He's one of the regulars from 1914. He's there before the PALS battalion show up in 1915 and a half. He's been around and he, the medals mean nothing to him anymore because it doesn't change his world. Exactly like you said, Eric, it means nothing to him anymore. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? And one thing I point out too, adding to this, the morale on the front lines, they didn't take, get leaves very often. They might've been in France or Belgium for two and a half years and all they got were letters home and their food was bad and their families would send packages of food. Although food was being rationed in England, it wasn't all that great either. Their morale was, was not great. You know, and you're seeing a bit of this in this movie. Are you talking uh, particularly about the British side there, Bob? Exactly. No? Exactly the British. And the French mutinied in 1917 because they had not had any leaves for the first three years of the war. And French units, after Verdun, began to, to uh, mutiny because of the poor conditions they were confronting in their life. Well, so, see, now, I, I've, I've read... Uh, Information that would contradict that, uh, particularly, um, and I just wrote it down. Oh, yes, it's a book uh, called Poilu um, by Louis Barthas. Uh, it's his notebooks um, that he kept during his time in the war. He, was, he came in in 1914, and he survived all the way to the end of the war. Uh, he was originally a barrel maker. Uh, and if you ever get a chance to read that, it is fantastic. Um, I read it. And Oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. He, he has leave um, at least four different times um, that he's he talks. About, I'm sorry. He's very lucky. Well, and he talks about leave as well for all the other guys. Um, it, and, you know, the best I can put it together, it seems roughly every nine to 12 months 
um, you know, he was getting leave to go back home. Now, you're right. He was lucky. And the British had it a little different because you couldn't just, you know, trek across the, the channel as easily as you could just jump on a train and go to, you know, the south of France or what have you. Um, but I don't know, just from the information I've read, it, it seemed like the French had it a little better as far as leave went, um, you know, for what it's worth. Uh, but then you're right, in 1917, with um, the, the, the pushback from the French soldiers, um, and I'll throw this out there as well, you know, why else in 1917 do you think maybe uh, that the French soldiers started to uh, push back a little bit uh, against their superiors? I won't say revolt, uh, but, you know. I think the French far more worse than the British the, the senior French leadership rarely got to the front line. And they, they would look at a map and tell a unit to, to go to objective X. And they didn't understand what the terrain was like between here and there. If you read about the Battle of Verdun, the 10 month battle that cost over 300,000 French lives and another 300,000 German lives, you'll see where the soldiers who were forced to do the, or carry out the orders that were commanded of them was atrocious. And the only thing the British had close to that was the later Battle of Passchendaele's, where they mm. were marched through mud that the generals didn't know how bad the conditions were, but ordered them for it anyways. So let's not depress everybody on the call. <laughs> <You know, laughs> even if it's tough being on the front lines, no matter who you were, the Americans were lucky to get into the game late. That's all we can say. I would also um, you know, attribute some of that to um, the Russian situation, uh, particularly with the French. Um, French have always been rather politically minded, politically motivated. And once they saw the Russians start to uh, go through this revolution and pull out of the war, you know, they're sitting there thinking to themselves, well, what are we doing here? Why don't we do the same thing? We're tired of this. We don't want to fight anymore. Um, you know, why can't we do that? Uh, and in that book I was just mentioning, there are several examples toward the end where there were soldiers who, uh, what is the, uh, the international? Um, you know, they would sing the international as they were marching from one, you know, battle to the next. And that just really set off their officers. They did not like that. But what could they do? Are you going to are you going to um, hold a whole squad or a whole company uh, accountable and punish them? No, you're going to have full out uh, revolution on your hands from them as well if you did that. So th the Russian uh, situation in 1917, it did impact, um, you know, the French uh, thoughts and whatnot, but I think we're kind of moving off the movie a little bit. Just Good a Lord, bit. <laughs> I start talking about World War One. I'm right there with you, Bob. I start talking about World War One, and it's you know, it's all over. <laughs> that and hockey. Don't get me talking about hockey either. <laughs> Comment about the Schofield and his medal. Sure. Um, I thought it was kind of a corollary or maybe a compliment to um, Colonel McKenzie at the end talking about last man standing because they're both having a very cynical view of the war at that point. So I thought uh, it's, it's kind of a premonition of, of what we're gonna see at the end. That is a good point, Chris. Um, and you mentioned cynical view. Do you think they are parallel views as far as their cynicism goes? No, they probably come from their, I think they probably come from different, uh, their different ranks. Uh, they have different views because of what they see and how they see it. Nice. Yeah, I, that that does make sense. Excellent. Anybody else have a, a comment on that before we move on? No. All right. Um, and then my next question kind of falls in line with what we were talking about at the beginning. Um, that the film illustrates a clear difference regarding the trench designs uh, by both the British and the Germans. Um, and more specifically, though, why do you think that the Germans built these more durable and spacious and better designed trench systems than the British? There's a particular mindset as to why they did it. Uh, why do you what do you think that mindset is? Do you want to take a stab at that? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Catherine. Thank you. Um, isn't that sort of the, the stereotype? which has some basis in um, experience or fact, that the German culture is just very precise, that you know, the trains run on time, things are built to, to a design, 
um, and it doesn't waver from that. Um, and, and it was built to last. Uh, maybe they thought that the war was, you know, going to be a long lasting situation or there would be an occupation or whatever, and these trenches would have a usefulness, um, you know, for a long term uh, intention. But I just think it's, you know, it reflects what I think of as the German mindset of, of being precise and um, well tooled, you know, like you think of a watch or a building or whatever that's just done done to perfection. I, I would I would agree with both of those uh, statements. Certainly, um, you know, Germans are known for um, their craftsmanship, um, and you know, whatever they make, it, it, it's built to last. It's very good. It's durable. But also because yes, the Germans did have that mindset that this is where they were going to be. They were going to win the war. And if they're going to have some sort of defensive structures in place, uh, they might as well be built, you know, well, uh, as opposed to something that's more temporary. And, you know, that can, you know, possibly just be abandoned and covered over rather quickly. Um, at least that's my sense of it. There was also the mindset of the, the British, more so than the French. They had the attitude that they were going to be on the offensive and they didn't want to get too caught up in building temporary earthwork fortifications mm -hmm. because they were going to move forward. Remember up in through 1916 and early 1917, they kept a cavalry reserve. If they planned mm -hmm. an offensive, they had a cavalry reserve always mm -hmm. sitting back mm -hmm. ready to exploit the penetration of the German defenses so the cavalry could go deep behind and decimate it all. And their attitude was, these are all temporary. Even after year after year, they were in the same place. They didn't mm -hmm. engineer themselves mentally to do what the Germans did. Yeah, and can I say in here, I think part of it too has a lot to do with the fact, remember Germany hadn't been Germany for very long. Yep. Absolutely, and that's a good king, point, Julie. And the, and the kingdom, the princedom that took over was Prussia and Prussia had a military culture. So they were all ready. Their culture was focused on, we're gonna make this a successful war. And to make it a success, you have to have, everything has to be done right. And I think that has something to do with it. And that I think does get caught. I think that does pick up on that. And if yeah, that, that's a, a very good point, Julie. You're, you're absolutely right. I think we tend to, to forget about how long the, you know, the nation of Germany has been around, which is not very long at all. Uh -uh, uh -uh. Um, and when you're looking at World War I, mm -hmm. they're, they're infants uh, as far as being a unified nation. Yes. And also adding to what you said, Julie, <coughs> the German army was technically far more advanced than their opponents early in the war. Mm -hmm. their, they had, their ratio of machine guns to other countries was incredible. Was they it? also invested in, in high caliber artillery and lots of it. The French had their 75. The British mm -hmm. had light, light artillery, some <laughs> heavy, but not much. Mm -hmm. uh, like the Battle of the Somme was too much light artillery, nothing that could destroy the heavy German sunken underground bunkers that they stayed mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a problem throughout the war. The Germans always had the heavy stuff and the French and the British and even the Americans only slowly came about to understanding the embrace of large caliber weapons that could really shake the ground and destroy things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they came into the war with that mindset and their opponents did not. They were essentially professional soldiers. Yes. And remember, the British Army was primarily designed to deal with rebellions in their colonies. You know, they, they, had a very, they had a very small army compared yes, to the yeah, Germans. They had a very small army. And the French were much the same. You know, they, the Germans mm -hmm. were the ones who didn't have a great number of colonies, but had mm -hmm. a mindset of what, what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And they built it for 30 years. The Schieffelin mm -hmm. plan took 70 years to develop, which they used in 1914. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I can't remember if it was Kent or if it was John who touched on this earlier about uh, when Blake dies, Schofield starts having second thoughts about, you know, continuing this mission. Uh, 
as we all know, he does um, follow, follows it through all the way to the end. Why do you think that he chose to press on instead of going back after Blake dies? What, what motivated him? Do you think? I think he had two motivations. The first one was it was the order to do it. And he was a good soldier. And the second motivation was he committed to his dying friend that he would do it. So he was, he was given a push. If, if one was going to waver, it was bolstered by the second and he continued. I, I would agree with you, John. I think you're exactly right. I think he, he saw the mission at that point as a continuation of the friendship that they had formed. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's always camaraderie between soldiers. Uh, there's always that bond, especially in times of war. Um, but I've noticed through all the research that I've done over the years in World War I, that bond just seems a lot stronger. Uh, these men went through absolute hell together. And so when you, you know, you committed to a person, it was till the end. Um, at least that's, that's, you know, what I've taken away from all the accounts that I've read. Uh, and so I, I would definitely agree with that second point, John, that, you know, he, he's committed to this mission uh, with Blake after Blake dies, and particularly because his brother's involved too. Um, you know, regardless of whether he wants to turn back or not, regardless of whether he thinks that this mission is, uh, to use the Private Ryan phrase, a total foobar, uh, he's still going to go forward and try his best to complete it, even if it means that he's going to follow the path of Blake and not make it to the end. And, and let us not forget that the script was written in that manner. And had he turned around and gone back, it wouldn't have been a very exciting movie after that, would it? <laughs> oh, Bob, we're talking about motivations. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> what, sort of, what sort of punishment would, it, would he have faced if he had gone back? Probably was nothing. Yeah, he, he probably could have come up with a good story on why he couldn't move forward anymore. Right, oh, right. Uh, but, you know, realistically, uh, had, you know, somebody found out that he just decided to turn back, it would have been a court martial, uh, most certainly, most certainly death. I don't, I don't think they would have given him. Uh, There's a lot of instances where soldiers were given jail time, um, given uh, hard manual labor, um, but to go against the order, particularly of a general that's given it to you directly to your face, uh, you know, that would probably be a death sentence for you if, if it was provable. But like, you know, Bob said, it, it would have been very easy for him to say, you know, I ran into this obstacle or that obstacle or, or whatever, and I was just, I had no choice but to turn back. And they would have said, oh, okay, well, yeah, you did your best. Um, at the end of the film, uh, we see Colonel McKenzie, uh, played by Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, talk about that quote that somebody just mentioned a few minutes ago, that there's only one way this is going to end, uh, last man standing. Um, what do you think this says about the type of leadership that was demonstrated by the officers during World War I? And does this also something, say something about the general attitude of the common soldier during that war? Maybe more of a philosophical question than anything. I, I, I would argue that, um, and, and we talked about it a little bit earlier, uh, leadership during World War I was harsh. Um, they, the officers were committed to um, completing the mission, whatever it was, whatever that mission was. Um, and if they had to sacrifice 10, 100, a thousand soldiers, that's what they would do. Um, and so for him to say that, you know, there's only one way that this is going to end is last man standing. Uh, he realizes that as well, but he's perfectly willing to follow through with that. And as we see at the end of the film, he was going to follow through with that. He was not going to listen to this soldier telling him that he has this urgent message um, until the very last second. Uh, they were not able to save the first wave. Uh, but they did save the rest of the troops. Um, I, I don't know what it says about the common soldier, but certainly the leadership uh, was, dare I say, pathetic. I, 
I, I have to think that, you know, each country that served in that, that combat did for their own reasons. As you so well know, and I think everyone on this, this Zoom call knows, soldiers at the lowest ranks that are at the point of the sword, they don't do it for their high ideals. They do it to protect their friends mm. because they know that they have no choice. And that's what's kept soldiers going for probably for as long as there's been warriors. What we saw in this movie by 1917, the British in particular were growing very, very tired of doing the same type of fighting that they did from 1914 through 1916. They were reluctant to do the frontal assaults which they learned simply do not work well. The Germans were much the same. Uh, you know, as we said, the Germans were better engineers. They engineered great offensives right up until the spring of 1918. They had their final offensive. Uh, when the Americans arrived on the scene, 1917 we declared war, but it wasn't until 1918 in the spring that there was really an American army in Europe. And our generals fought the fight like the British and the Germans and the French did in 1914. We had horrific casualties. The casualty levels that the British and the French and the Germans were no longer experiencing because their change of attitude and understanding. Our people were young, eager, although their generals were often very, very, American generals were often very old in the First World War. And they used cavalry tactics against the Indians thinking that would work against soldiers in trenches with machine guns and artillery. <laughs> I mean, it's just a reality of the fact. Uh, but I think there were always those who felt one last push, we break through the lines and it's the end of the war. That existed on every single front in every single country. And that existed in our forces right up, in, right up until 11 o'clock on November 11th when our soldiers continue to attack that morning, knowing the ceasefire would end at 11, we had over 10,000 casualties. The Americans had 10,000 casualties on our missus day because our generals weren't willing to say stop. And so we had young men die and get horribly wounded right up until 11 o'clock because of that enthusiasm of general officers. Bob, you know, there was, uh, I think it was the Lieutenant uh, that met Schofield at the farmhouse and put him on the truck. I wrote down one of the things he said. He said, make sure there are witnesses because some men just like to fight. Mm, yeah. yeah. And I, when, he, when he explained his orders to him, he said, yep, make sure because there are some men you can tell them the thing has been called off, but they're going to continue going. So. Yeah, that's a really good point, John. Um, and and I do remember when I saw it, and 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 he he's you know he he put that line out there, and I I caught myself nodding in agreement. I was like, yeah, you better make sure that there's witnesses because you're absolutely right. Um, and you know, as as I just mentioned a minute ago, um, uh, Cumberbatch's character, he that's exactly what he was going to do. He was not going to listen to him. Um, fortunately, he was able to get that message to him. He's able to make make him read it um and he did change his mind i there was that pause after he reads the message um he pauses for a second and i thought for sure that he was just going to say you know he's going to wad up the paper and tell him to go forward anyway i was a little surprised that he um you know that he called everything off to be honest first time i saw it i thought he was gonna uh go through with it anyway and you know it might be a tragic ending well, there's fiction, there's fiction built into that scene. The fiction is, is that you have a British general with a scar on his face, wearing a helmet that close to the front trenches. Mm. That's not how the British fought. Probably the highest rank you would find anywhere close to that leading edge would be a Lieutenant Colonel. Mm. The generals were much far away looking at paper. They would come to inspect the trenches rarely make it to the front line at all for four years of war in the British Army. That was such a shocker that those who fought in the First World War, who stayed in the British Army, and became promoted and fought in the Second World War like Montgomery, were just the reverse, where they insisted that their generals were at the front. So they really understood the conditions that their soldiers were facing. So that, that, that story, to make it real, would have had to take place about three miles or further away from the front line because that's where the decisions were made. 
not at the point of the sword. Well, General General Aaron Moore too. Um, you know, he's he's in the bunker uh, more toward the front as well. Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit uh, and talk about the movie making aspects of all this. Um, and one of the questions I, I or this really wasn't a question. It was more just to have everybody comment um, on how do you think the actors prepared for this movie, um, particularly when you consider that it was heavily reliant on what Hollywood likes to call the long shot or that never ending, that continuous um you know, movement without breaks or anything like that. Uh, how do you think the actors, you know, prepared for this? And what kind of effort do you think they had to put forward uh, to make that believable? I think it probably was very similar to a, like a live performance, you know, where because the takes were so long, you know, as the take went further and further along, you didn't want to screw it up because, you know, you, want, you wanted to keep everything, the, moment, the momentum of the scene going. And you know you couldn't you couldn't trip or you couldn't muff your lines or anything, because because of all those the takes were all so long. It was probably I think it was maybe similar to being in theater, or you know live performances. I would also well, I think they probably had to do some kind of exercise regimen ahead of time because it was it looked very strenuous the running and the you know and again the long shot so they'd have to keep going and going and going. I think the actors were probably excited by the opportunity, and my guess is they probably all saw the movie "They Shall Not Grow Old" because the Imperial War Museum had all that film, and probably a lot of you have seen oh, it already. Yes, yes. So they colorized and they restored yes. all of that. Uh, the one thing though, that when you see the movie again, if you notice all the other actors are equipped properly for their place in 1917. They all have their gas mask on their chest. The two main actors have their gas mask back over their shoulders behind them. That is not how you would wear your gas mask because you had very little time to quickly don that mask. and. I, I laughed because I thought to myself, everybody else is doing it right. What's the matter with you two? You know? <laughs> so if you see the movie again, look at them. Their mask is way up on their shoulders and there's at the small of their back, not in the front where it needs to be. And I don't know why they did that. I really don't. But uh, if there's, if you haven't seen on YouTube, they have videos about the making of 1917. And it is dramatic how landscape the work they did to create such long trenches through the countryside and to see the actors holding that camera in front of the two main characters as they walk through the trenches, that's astonishing. That, if you don't recognize it the first time, look at it the second time and you'll, you'll be amazed or there's no cuts. It's all one roll. What's your time? I watched, the, um, I watched 1917 on a Blu-ray disc and they have the bonus features on that. Um, and if you watch the bonus features, you really see what an extraordinary piece of filmmaking this is about uh, the, the uh, cinematographer talks about how uh, blending the scenes so that you don't even notice the cuts, but when they explain it, all of a sudden you're realizing, boy, was I fooled. Oh yeah. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was extraordinary. And if you, on the Blu-ray disc as well, you can also watch the movie with the cinematographer giving commentary as it goes along. And oh really? Describes yeah, and he describes how, um, uh, for instance, the opening scene, he describes how they, how they pulled back with the camera, how they transferred the camera from a dolly or whatever it was to a uh, handheld, uh, how, they, how, they, how they wiped out a huge crane that was in the middle of that, in the middle of that scene by, uh, by various techniques. Uh, truly amazing. Uh, and I, I recommend the Blu-ray disc with, the, with particularly the bonus features. If you buy it on iTunes, you can also, uh, if you buy it, not rent it, but if you buy it on iTunes, $14.99, I think, you, you get the bonus features too. That's what we did. We haven't watched them yet. <laughs> one, one feature that I saw, and Eric, stop me if I'm going to talk about something that you had planned to say already, is when one of the main characters is bayoneted and he's dying. Uh, this is brought up in the Blu-ray and the other things as well. His coloring in his face mm. reflects that of someone who's bleeding out. That was not makeup. That was no. one scene. And that was the actor himself who somehow pulled that off. 
and that to me is astonishing that that he was able to literally get that waxen grayish color as he's bleeding out that and he did that on his own there was no makeup involved which to me is just I, I couldn't believe it yeah. I heard that we talked about that right too. Yeah. yeah we had yeah. we had picked up on that and I commented to Karen I said look at that the guys you, you can see he's getting whiter yeah yeah I also think the cinematographer just the the logistics of doing the long shot when they were in the trenches you would see them from behind and the shot continued and then you'd see them coming toward you so they had to keep that shot going both front and back if you will so it was uh amazing running through the fields uh after they got past the uh, barbed wire and into no man's land they did the same thing. They were watching him from behind as he went through the gap. And the next scene or the, the next sight you saw was him coming toward you. So uh, when you talk about uh, physical ability, I think the cameraman had to be uh, yeah. pretty physical too. Yeah. I, never well, that. I think one thing that, that they could not capture, which is unfortunately a technical limitation, is what the horrific smells of the trenches in no man land would be when you see the bodies decaying and you know they obviously graphically added flies to the dead horses and that sort of thing but bob that's okay many yeah, that's okay. <laughs> many of the world war one world war two well actually all war veterans who've been in bad places talk about the smells that the smell of cordite and rotting flesh and all those things are to them as vivid a memory as the things they saw and we can't capture that, but by creating the flies and the disgusting cadavers, I think they came as close as they could. I will definitely mm -hmm. agree with that. Uh, when I was in Desert Storm, we got a chance to go down to the Valley of Death, uh, which is where um, they caught the Iraqis trying to flee Kuwait, uh, and we bombed the hell out of them. And, and well, I'm sorry? A tens in action. Actually, absolutely right. Um, and I'll, I'll never forget the smell um, of that place. Never in my life. Uh, it is, there's no other smell like it. Uh, and it's just absolutely horrible. Um, and then, so yeah, in no man's land, I couldn't even imagine. That was probably 10, 15, 20 times worse. Um, yeah. I, I hate to give away all of the, uh, the magic of Hollywood. Um, John, you were talking about the, uh, being able to see from behind and then simultaneously to see them from the front. Those are achieved by 360 degree cameras. Um, we used at the museum a similar technique with our cemetery tours. Um, and it's, I'm sure, you know, what they're using on those sets is far more uh, technologically advanced than what we used, but that's achieved through a 360 degree camera. Um, and I will tell you that these actors did rehearse for six months uh, before filming this. Um, and even while they were uh, taking breaks during the filming, whether it was due to weather or what have you, they were still rehearsing the next scene coming up to make sure that they had everything just right. Um, the, and, and then you also mentioned um, the, uh, the production design. Um, they, what they did was they put everything into a computer model and they tracked it down to the very inch and foot and made sure that everything was exactly precise before they even started to think about filming it. All the actors knew where they had to be at this particular moment. If I am saying this word, my body has to be turned just so. Um, and it was quite, uh, quite an adventure for them, um, reading some of the interviews with the production designers and his team. Um, I hate to ruin everything. There were 48 different instances where filming switched. Um, just watching it initially, I counted 12. Um, and you know, the, the camera just for a split second passes behind somebody's back. Editors can stop it right there and do whatever they need to do to make it look like it's seamless. Uh, but 48 different instances where there are cuts in the film. Uh, it does not show up in the film, at least when you're watching it, which is a credit to not only the cinematographers, but also the editors, too. Um, those editors have to sit in those rooms and find those little spots where they're putting that film together. And it's a painstaking process. Um, the longest shot in the film is eight and a half minutes long. Wow. Uh, 
Uh, the shortest shot is 39 seconds long. Um, so just to talk about the way they splice this all together was fantastic. And then, uh, Bob, you were talking about, you know, the uniforms were correct, except for the two gas masks um, and everything else. And then somebody also mentioned, I think it was maybe it was Julie, I think it was Marianne, uh, the physical fitness that these um, these actors had to had to have to film this. Um, they hired a military technical advisor. His name was Paul Bettis, uh, 24 years in the British Special Forces as a paratrooper. Um, and after he got out, he turned all of his um, experience and knowledge toward films. Uh, and he really put these guys through the rigor. Uh, and it, one interview I read, it said it literally started from the ground up. One of the first things they learned how to do was take care of their feet because they were in these trench systems all the time that were filled with water. And real World War I soldiers, they had massive amounts of trench foot, uh, you know, skin rotting and everything else. So that was one of the first things they taught them was how to take care of this, how to recognize when your feet are starting to, to find hot spots where they're starting to rot away. Um, they used authentic training manuals, uh, authentic plans and um, wow. French systems when they were putting all that together. They went back to the engineer designs that they had from World War I. So they really went out of their way to make this as authentic as they could. Um, it's a credit to the actors of all the effort that they put in. Filming just took a little short of three months um, for the wow. entire process. Wow. I, I was surprised when I read that. Wow. Um, if you look at some movies like uh, what we were talking about last time, Apocalypse Now, uh, you know, that movie took over a year to film um, and you could edit it and cut different scenes at your leisure. They didn't have that that option this time. Uh, and it's to be able to, to, to film it all in three months uh, was outstanding. One thing I thought was amazing is you couldn't tell where there would be stunt doubles performing, you know, different scenes. Um, and, and that was part of the seamlessness of it. I mean, you know, you got people falling into rivers and jumping off of things and whatever. And you, you, I just always had the sense that it was those two characters. Yeah, you're right. And then don't forget there's somebody has to be filming all that too, uh, particularly when Schofield has to jump into the river um, right. after he flees the, the French village. There had to be a cameraman there who had to jump with him. And actually that was one of the scenes where they were able, the, the way they did it, they were able to cut it. Um, he wasn't even really jumping into a river. He was jumping onto a mat off the side of a little ledge. Um, but the way they were able to splice that together, amazing, simply amazing. <laughs> I was gonna say um, that, um, go ahead, John. Comment. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. I was gonna say that uh, one of the points in the, um, uh, the, the uh, bonus features was about how they uh, prepared for the trench scenes because they uh, what they did was they staked it out on dry land uh, over that whole period and they ran their um, uh, they did their prep by doing the doing the script walking through the dry land where they were going to be building the trenches and the point that was uh, I, I think the cinematographer made the point uh, the, the language I think was you don't want to run out of land before you run out of script. Absolutely. So they, had, so they were testing that throughout. Um, it, it, uh, and the, that scene about jumping into the river and the bonus, there's a little snippet where you can see that there's a green screen behind him as he's making that jump. Mm. I, I will admit uh, you're absolutely right on, on running out of land before script. I've done some uh, some stage acting. And as you have to go from one side of the stage to the other and you're reciting your lines, you don't want to, you know, get to the other end of the stage and still have another paragraph to go. <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> the, one, the one thing they did in the movie is the trenches are longer and straighter than you would have found there. There would have been constant traverses along the front trench. The idea being that if, if someone gets into the trench, they can't shoot sideways very far to try to shoot people further and further away. And also if an artillery round comes in, that, that round will only obliterate a certain small part of the trench and those who are in there, not the whole thing. But um, I'm not gonna change subject too much, but if you get a chance, look at the bayonets that they carried. Look at how long they are. 
This was the last war that soldiers carried long bayonets on both sides, on all sides. And that's because prior to World War I, the whole idea with weaponry was you fire at the enemy a couple times, then your rifle becomes a spear. So you want a big, long spear in front. But by the end of World War I, they realized that wasn't really being done much and that you didn't need to have this expensive and heavy giant blade out the front of a rifle when a little six inch or one foot blade will work compared to the two foot blades often some of the soldiers had on the front of their rifles. And Which adds an extra pound or two. Yeah, and so that's an example of how some of the technology didn't that they found failed in the First World War never got used again. Just a minor point. But if you, there's a good chance to see them up close with a, with a rifle with a bayonet on it. Pretty amazing. Uh, we are a little bit over time. Uh, if everybody's willing to stick around, there's just two more things I want to bring up. Um, I want to talk about uh, the production design crew um, and, and how they not only created the trenches, uh, but particularly the French village. Um, I was I was really impressed with some of the things that I was reading about that. Um, the production design crew was headed up, like I said earlier, by Dennis Gassner. Um, and because of how they shot the film with the long continuous shot, uh, that French village, that whole scene really had to be super tight. Um, what they did was they computer modeled the whole village, 150 buildings, um, oh. as it would have looked probably before the war. And then they put in a computer simulation program that destroyed the whole village as it probably would have looked during the war. And what they had left is what they built. Um, I thought that that was pretty amazing that they went into that much detail just to create this ruin of a French village um, is, is pretty outstanding. Uh, and then as Bob was saying with the trench systems as well, over 5,200 feet of trenches were dug for this movie. Um, and they went so far as to go to France and look at the soil that was in these different places. Uh, and then when they went back to England where this was filmed um, and, and the trench scenes were filmed mostly in a place called Low Force, uh, which is on River Tees in Teesdale. I have no idea where that is. Uh, but they looked at the soil at Teesdale and they realized that it was not the same as it was in France. So they brought in different combinations of colors of soil to make it so that it was, you know, for people who would look at that and go, oh, that's not, you know, as chalky as it was in France. Um, they, they really put a lot of effort into making this as realistic as possible. Um, on the production design side, uh, which I thought was amazing. Um, the last thing, of course, I'd love to ask everybody, um, is your favorite character and why? And I've already said mine. Mine was Lieutenant Leslie. Uh, he just, I don't know, he just seemed to embody, um, you know, a lieutenant who was just sick and tired of being in those trenches, fighting all the time, listening to these soldiers complain. He really had an attitude about him that I thought was fantastic. And then when he, you know, as just before um, Blake and Schofield go over the top, you know, he has this little uh, uh, flask of whiskey and he, he christens them. And I just, that cracked me up. Uh, but I'd like to know everybody else's favorite character and, and what you really enjoyed about him. Uh, like Catherine the, and Kent, we'll start with you guys. Um, I like the guy John was talking about earlier, the, um, who um, uh, rescued him or, or, you know, approached him at the uh, farmhouse after uh, Blake had died and, you know, gave him all the compassionate advice about, uh, you know, you, you, you mourn quick and then you move on. Uh, and gave him the advice about, you know, no witnesses and, you know, uh, hoped, hoped to get him all the way to the town and so forth. Uh, I, I liked that uh, character. He, I think he was uh, probably mine too. And he also said, hope is a dangerous thing uh, when they were talking about going further on. And he, you know, when we look at some of these war movies, uh, we look at the officer to enlisted type of separation, and it didn't seem like he had that. He was, right. too, he was very compassionate about helping him along, and then when they went as far as they could go, he wished him well and shook his hand. So, yeah, he was uh, kind of the guy that stood out for me. Catherine, how about you? 
Um, yeah, I, I'll just pass my turn on to another viewer for a comment. Okay. Eric, I'm with you. The Lieutenant really portrays well what, what it would have been like, I'm sure, for a young British officer who had become an old man very quickly in the trenches. Mm. Very cynical, you know, they would receive all these optimistic cheerleader type reports. Men, you know, we're doing so well and this and that, God, glory and country, you know, king and country. And yet they were the ones who were seeing their men die for what they thought was rather foolish. And he, he to me epitomizes far more uh, what I think the, those in the trenches who experienced and lived in the mud and died in the mud, what their philosophies were by 1917. Mm. Chris, how about you? I kind of like Blake's brother at the end. I thought that he that it kind of captured uh, in his expression, in his comments to uh, Schofield, everything that was that had happened in this in this whole uh, in this whole movie. That was the that was what Schofield wanted to do when he had t when he took the uh, the rings and the dog tag from uh, uh, from Blake. Uh, I thought that acted as kind of an incentive for him to get there and seeing uh, uh, Joseph Blake's response when he was handed those uh, those items, the silence, the stunned silence. Um, I just thought that, that there was a lot there that, uh, that uh, really captured what was going on in the film. I also liked the, um, the French woman uh, that, uh, that he met along the way um, and that, that interlude there, that, that almost peaceful interlude uh, that, uh, that she brought to the movie. Excellent. Julie, how about you? Not your past. Anybody else uh, want to chime in before we uh, close this out? Yeah, I my favorite character I think was was Schofield. I mean, I, I think it showed a, a evolution of character as the movie went on. You know how he was reluctant, or he didn't know why he was asked on this mission, didn't want to do it, to the point where he was now alone and he was going to complete the mission mm -hmm, no matter mm -hmm, what for mm -hmm, his buddy. Mm -hmm. So. I, I thought it showed good character development, I guess, but I would say that would be my favorite. Yeah, yeah, and, and now that my my microphone is turned back on, <laughs> I did like that too. I guess I came into all of this because when I was studying German, I had to read All Quiet on the Western Front, invest in Nick Neues, and I kept looking for that person. And at the end, Schofield kind of, he kind of evolved into the the uh, the protagonist in in All Quiet on the Western Front, and it felt like um, Paul, right? Yeah, yep, yep. yep. Um, and at the end, where he says the translation is, you know, I was I am so alone. I have no hope. Everything is gone. She's been so alone, so alone, so alone. Um, which doesn't translate well, but. <laughs> He's lost the ability to hope. And that kind of, that's what I was kind of looking for. And I thought that at the end, Schofield came through with that. That whole, that was the person. And kind of an interesting side note, Julie, uh, if you, and I'm actually glad you brought this up because I did want to talk about this. Mm -hmm. I just didn't get a chance to. Um, as you notice, as he goes through the movie, he starts mm -hmm. with all of his equipment, everything that he has. At the very end, he has nothing. Nothing. Nothing left. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. it is symbolic of exactly what you just said. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely yep. right. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think this movie, for its technical flaws, you know, the plot line, you know, for those who study these things, what I think about this movie is like, there are only two or three movies that probably capture the experience of being a in the trench soldier in World War One, mm -hmm. uh, all quiet on the Western Front. This mm -hmm. movie and another movie called Paths of Glory, that's mm -hmm. been around for a long, long time. Kirk uh, Douglas. Kirk Douglas, uh, because it's a forgotten war. It's a hundred years ago, and it's a sideshow for us. So mm -hmm. we don't really think about that. You think of all the World War II movies 
since 1945 of soldiers in combat mm -hmm. and their experiences, good, bad, you know, hokey or really sincere. This is one of three from World War One that killed millions and millions of people. You have three movies probably that that fit that. Mm -hmm. And I don't blame it all on indifference. I blame it on sim photography in the 20s was nothing like it is today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now, now I'm glad that we're starting to look back a little bit. Uh -huh. I think maybe it's because they're running out of things to write about, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you ever get to Europe. You can only make so many Shrek movies. <laughs> yeah, if you get to Europe, I strongly urge you to go out of your way to go down to some of the places such as Chateau Terre and further south, where there are beautiful, massive monuments, the size of the Lincoln Memorial uh, mm -hmm. that are there, that were built in the 30s. They were not touched by the Germans in World War II and they are magnificent and they're empty. No one goes. Every mm -hmm. time I've been to them, there's been a handful. I sometimes, I'm a historian for military tours to Europe and I take them there and they kind of want to go to Normandy. They want to go to the Battle of the Balls because those are the things they've seen all the movies about. But World War I, like Montfaucon, the heroism of that battle, uh, it's worth your time to drive a little out of your way to see the beautiful American cemeteries with our World War I casualties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they had the cleanest bathrooms in Europe. If you go to the cemetery, stop at the bathroom and relish that wonderfully clean room you're in. <laughs> But this movie is excellent. And Eric, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And Molly, for putting this together tonight. You're making COVID a little bit more bearable. Yes, well, thank you. No, no problem. We This is my favorite event to, to host. Um, unfortunately, I will not be with you next month. Um, our um, education team uh, member, Mike Olson, is going to be hosting this. Uh, mm -hmm. I will be on the road uh, tra traveling for Christmas break. But we are going back to World War I again uh, next uh, month. And we're going to look at the 2005 film, I think it's 2005, Joy Noel, uh, that talks about the Christmas truce um, in 1917, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 1914, so, uh, 19 my, my fault. Uh, so look forward to that. Um, and again, this was a great discussion. Uh, I, like I said, I love doing these movie nights. Um, and everybody always has uh, interesting comments and interesting takes uh, that sometimes I don't uh, pick up on. So it's, it's really great to hear everybody else's viewpoints as well. It just uh, it makes me feel a lot smarter by listening to all of you. Um, thank you so much uh, for showing up tonight. I hope everybody has a great weekend and we will definitely see you next time.